this morning. Um, we've seen this slide for a while now, right? Uh, we, a similar slide, uh, changed the name on the, the weekly title. But um, we've been walking through the books, originally the book of Ezra and Nehemiah, right? In the Old Testament. Um, I want to tell you something. I've, I've, been, I've loved it. I, I hope it's been good for you um, as we've learned about uh, Ezra and Nehemiah and learned about um, God's people returning to the land. And so this morning, we, you say, Pastor, didn't we finish that up, you know, two weeks ago when you were here? Um, yeah, we did. We finished up the text. But um, I want to talk to you this morning about some bigger picture stuff, okay? Because you've probably either thought this or heard this. Uh, we're New Testament people. That Old Testament stuff, um, you know, that's stuff that's outdated and we don't, we just, you know, we don't really understand that. Listen, uh, the Old Testament points towards the new, okay? And I want to show you that more than ever um, in, the te- in the sermon we're going to look at this morning. We're going to wrap up this series that we called Rebuilding Your Life on the Promises of God because that's what the Israelites were doing, okay? They had ignored the promises of God, many of them, and they had disobeyed God and they um, gotten into idolatry and marrying the, intermarrying the peoples of the land and worshiping foreign idols and stuff. And because of that, God exiled them from the land, right? That did not negate his promises. I'm kind of getting ahead of myself a little bit here, but God then brought them back. And friends, just as they could trust on God's promises, so can we. Amen? Now, um, let, let, let me pause there for just a moment. Um, I know some of you here, for those of you who are NFL fans, or for those of you who know the NFL, um, follow it at all, maybe you are familiar that this past week was the start of something big in the NFL life. Anybody know what that was? Probably don't have a whole lot. It was the start of NFL free agency. Okay, It was the start of NFL free agency where some players, their contracts are up with one team, and they get an opportunity to kind of, the teams get to shop around, get to offer uh, contracts to new players and stuff, and so they get a chance to get new players on their teams. And so uh, if you are uh, into the NFL, many NFL people get really excited, fans get really excited about this, just like they do. The draft's going to happen here in a couple of months and get really excited about the draft. Um, now, for those of you who don't follow the NFL, you may wonder, and maybe wondering now, who cares? I know that's what Brandon's thinking. <laughs> right? Thank you. Yeah, see, thank you for being honest, right? That's what Brandon said. Who cares? Who cares uh, which players change teams? You know, who cares what ball they throw in what basket? Um, <laughs> who cares, you know, um, what players get drafted to which team? And you say, Pastor, why in the world are you even talking about this? Let me explain why I'm talking about it. Let me explain why many NFL fans, if you're a fan of NFL team, Um, why you probably care at least a little bit, and that is this, friends. It's because these things bring hope to a fan base. They bring hope to a fan base. Um, If your team can get the right players, listen, if we could just sign that guy, we could just sign that guy, then our team is going to be better, and we're going to hopefully do better and go to the uh, playoffs and maybe win the championship. And so, These times when they they sign players and draft players, it's time when even the worst NFL team, listen, this is the time that Cleveland Brown fans can have hope. (laughs) This is the time when New York Jets fans have hope. Um, And I hate to say it, listen, even right now, this is the time when my team this year has hope for signing players, Um, not the Bears. How about that? Not the Bears. This is time when the Bears fans, I'm probably getting too close to home with that and so forth, can have hope. Well, friends, listen, the reason I tell you about this is for the Israelites, their hope lay not in the free agent in free agency or in the draft. As we just sang, their hope lay in Jesus Christ. Now you say, but that's old testament. Their hope lay in what they were looking forward to. Amen? Uh, Their hope lay in the promises that God had made to their ancestors. 
to Abraham, to Isaac, Jacob, Moses, David, on down the line, right? Promises of a land, promises that he would give them a future and make them into a great and mighty nation, that he would multiply them, and that through them, God would bless the whole world. We're going to look at that here in just a second, friends, but that's how they kept going. That's how they kept going, is by putting their hope in the promises of God. That's why that, uh, these several groups here in Ezra and Nehemiah went back to the promised land because they had hope in God's promises. It's why they went back to rebuild the temple. Why would you rebuild a temple that had been torn down? Let's move on. Let's, we're in a new place. Let's get, that's what some of them thought, some of them that didn't go back, right? But others said, no, we're going to trust in the promises of God, and that is centered in a place called Jerusalem. It's why they went back to rebuild the walls. It's why they went back to get restored into the land. It's because of of their hope in what God had done, was continuing to do, and what he would do. I want to look at that some this morning. Uh, Here in Ezra and Nehemiah, We've seen the promises of God alive. We've seen both Ezra and Nehemiah testify. The books of Ezra and Nehemiah testify in many ways to how God's promises have been fulfilled and how other promises of God are still alive. This morning, I want to show you that. Uh, we, listen, we could look at lots of different things here in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. We've talked about some of these things as we've gone through, but um, honestly, I could probably preach through Ezra and Nehemiah again, and we could hit on a lot, of, a lot more things than we've already hit on, okay? There's so much in God's Word. But this morning, I want to show you three ways in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah that God's promises are still alive. We're going to talk about some of the things that we've already talked about in Ezra and Nehemiah and kind of tie those together, um, looking at them from a greater, bigger picture. Number one, how do we see God's promises? How have we seen God's promises alive in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah? First of all, it's this, friends. One way we see that is in the fact that the Israelites are restored to the land. In the simple fact that the Israelites are restored to the land. Friends, that was a fulfillment of a promise and a prophecy of God. Amen? Now, first scripture we're going to look at this morning, and I would invite you to turn to with me, is Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12. I don't think I mentioned that already. I should have. But you can turn your Bibles there. It is going to be on the screen behind us. In Genesis chapter 12, um, we have here God's call to Abram. Yes, before he renamed him Abraham, okay? But God called Abram to follow him to a new land. And if Abram would, then God laid out how he would bless him. Look at Genesis chapter 12, beginning in verse 1. We read, now the Lord had said to Abram, get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and I will curse him who curses you and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So, multiplicity of promises there, right? So Abram departed as the Lord had, excuse me, spoken to him and Lot went with him. And Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Then Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their possessions that they had gathered and the people whom they had acquired in Haran. And they departed to go to the land of Canaan. So they came to the land of Canaan. Abraham passed through the land to the place of Shechem, as far as the terebinth tree of Morah, and the Canaanites were then in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, to your descendants, I will give this land. And there he built an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. Now, this is God's call of Abraham, and in this call, God 
made multiple promises to Abram. He promised to make his name great. And I would say that his name has been made great. Amen? Uh, We're still talking about him today. Uh, That's proof. Um, God promised not only that, but promised to bless him and to make him into a great nation and give him uh, more descendants um, than he could count, okay? Um, and, and, And promised that he would be a blessing to the whole world. And he promised the very last, at the end here, we see the, the, more of that promise. He promised that he would give that land that he'd taken Abraham to, the land of Canaan, what we now know as the promised land, what is modern day Israel and Palestine and all of that area. He promised to give to Abram and all of his descendants forever. So that's the part of the promise we're going to focus on. So part of that promise was that Abram's descendants would possess and dwell in the land. So let me ask you a question. Did they do that? Not initially, right? Not initially. You know, they had, they, they did, and then they, they had a bypass because of famine down to Egypt, right? And then God brought them back and told them, go in the land. And they said, oh, the people are too big. We can't do that. And so then they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. But after that, Joshua led them to conquer the land, right? And so they began to possess the land. And now they didn't do everything God had told them to do, as we've talked about before, but they possessed the land. They went and they lived in the land. And God then gave them um, rulers and leaders to lead over them. We've looked at the judges before. And then they asked for a king and God gave them a king. And then God gave them their greatest king, King David, right? And then God gave them some other kings that didn't do so well. And because of some of those other kings and their disobedience to God and their uh, idolatry and intermarrying with people of the land and disobeying God, God began to warn them, okay? God warned them through the prophets that if they didn't turn back to him, what was he going to do? Kick them out of the land. But in that promise, in all the times God promised that he would dispel them from the land, you know what else he promised? I'll bring you back. I want you to look at this verse, Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 3. Jeremiah writes this, For behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will bring back from captivity my people Israel and Judah, says the Lord. And I will cause them to return to the land that I gave to their fathers, and they shall possess it. So, God warned them of exile, warned them if they didn't turn back to him that he would exile them, and and he sent them out of the land. But even before he did that, he promised that he would bring them back to the land. He said, listen, I promised to give this. I promised Abraham that I would give this to you guys, and you've been disobedient. So listen, yes, I have to discipline you, but guess what? You know what? You're going to spend some time out of the land, but then I'm going to bring you back, friends. And let, that's what we've seen here throughout Ezra and Nehemiah, right? We saw, we've seen in Ezra and Nehemiah, God bring the Israelites back to the promised land. Did you know that God even spoke specifically to and through the prophet Isaiah over 150 years before he brought the Israelites back? So before they even went to exile, before they got conquered by Babylon and Assyria and and, and went into exile, taken into exile, God prophesied how he was going to bring them back. I want you to look at Isaiah chapter 44 with me. Isaiah chapter 44, the very last verse of that, speaking of the Lord, says this. It it says, who says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd. This is God speaking, talking about Cyrus. Now, who is Cyrus? As we have learned from Ezra, Cyrus was the king of Persia. Okay, who issued, well, let me not get ahead of myself, okay? But here, what Isaiah is writing was written at approximately, probably at least 150 years before what he's talking about actually happened. Who says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd, and he shall perform all my pleasure. 
saying to Jerusalem, you shall be built, and to the temple, your foundation shall be laid. Isn't that exactly what happened in Ezra and Nehemiah? It's exactly what happened. Verse, chapter 45, look at the next verse. Thus says the Lord to his anointed. Now, that's an interesting word there. It's actually uh, the word that's sometimes translated Messiah, okay? So uh, there's probably, there's a lot more into this prophecy and so forth than just this, but the, it's interesting that God calls Cyrus his chosen, his anointed here, but to Cyrus whose right hand I have held. In other words, God directed Cyrus to do something very particular. Now, so, now what I want you to do is I want you to turn back to Ezra chapter 1, okay? Ezra chapter 1, verse 1. And the very first verses that we read in the book of Ezra. Now, we talked about this at the time, but we want to hit this a little bit more. Now, in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled. So not only did Isaiah prophesy about this, but so did Jeremiah. The Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and also put it in writing saying, thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, all the kingdoms of the earth, the Lord God of heaven has given me and he has commanded me this is a non-Jew, a non-Israelite. God has, is, is saying here, he has commanded me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Friends, so after looking at Isaiah, Jeremiah, looking at the prophecies God made, when we read here in Ezra chapter 1 that Cyrus says God has commanded him to build a temple at Jerusalem, it should not surprise us, friends. We know that God has said, he said beforehand that he would do this. So when we read that, that Cyrus, a, a heathen king, was directed by the God of the universe to initiate the Israelites to go back to, Israel, to Jerusalem and, and Israel and rebuild the temple, friends, only God can do that, amen? God used Cyrus to restore the Israelites to the land. Friends, God kept his word. Amen? God restored them to the land, um, which is part of that greater promise that we read that God gave to Abram. Friends, despite their sin, God, God restoring the Jews to the promised land shows us that God's promises are still alive. God never fails. He keeps his promises. Even though they disobeyed and he had to discipline them and send them out of the land, right? He brought them back to the land to show them that his promises are true. That he keeps his promises. That the promises that he made to Abraham and to the world are still alive. Friends, so we can trust in them. Amen? We can trust in God's promises, and we can build our lives on them. Number two, how can we trust in God's promises? Uh, how do we see God's promises alive in Ezra and Nehemiah? Not only in that the fact that the Israelites are restored to the land, but second, friends, in the fact that Ezra and Nehemiah both serve as symbolic types pointing to Jesus. Ezra and Nehemiah both serve as symbolic types pointing to Jesus. And let me do a little bit of explanation here, okay? A type is a literary term um, used particularly about Scripture um, in which a type is a symbol of something in the future, okay? It is something that serves as a symbol of something in the future, such as an Old Testament event or an Old Testament, in this case, person serving as a prefiguration or a foreshadowing of a New Testament person or a New Testament event, okay? Um, we're not talking about Ezra and Nehemiah being, um, uh, being a Christophany, okay? This was not, we've talked about that before, that there are times in the Old Testament that um, Jesus, before he came to earth, actually appeared in various ways, 
but this is not one of those. These are two men, Ezra and Nehemiah, but in the roles that God gave them, they foreshadowed who Jesus would be. Let me explain. Let me show you a little bit more. Um, now, Nehemiah more than Ezra, as you'll see here, but both of them, um, there are things, and probably as we've been going through Ezra and Nehemiah, um, I didn't really bring these out a lot at the time, but there are things that happened, and you're like, wow, that, that's kind of like what Jesus did. Let me show you what I'm talking about. First of all, let's talk about Ezra. Uh, in a very general way, Ezra was a man of the book, right? He was a man of God's word who sought to purify God's people and lead them to a true, genuine heart of worship. Friends, isn't that what Jesus came to do? Amen? He came to ultimately purify us and lead us to a true, genuine heart of worship. So in that way, Ezra is like Jesus. Second, in Ezra chapter 9, If you'll remember, Ezra responded to Israel's sin. Remember when they again um, began intermarrying with the people of the land? Ezra became appalled. And um, he began to do all sorts of things, but he, he wept over Jerusalem because of their sin. Does that remind you of anything Jesus did? Jesus did something very similar in Luke chapter 19, Jesus wept over Jerusalem because of their rejection of him, their refusal to receive and welcome him, friends. So in both of these ways, Ezra gives us a picture, okay? He gives us a picture of the one to come. He gives us a picture. He serves as a symbolic type pointing All right, I know I'm kind of look kind of silly right now and stuff, but I'm trying to give you a little bit of a visual here, pointing to Jesus, okay? Now, then we have Nehemiah. Uh, First of all, in Nehemiah chapter 13, we saw Nehemiah stop people from buying and selling goods on the Sabbath. Remember that? And he did several things. He cleansed the temple. You remember when um, the priest Eliashib let Tobiah their, one of their enemies have a room in the temple. Remember that? And Nehemiah came in and he took his stuff and he threw it out. I don't know about you. When I read that, I'm like, man, how similar is that? Jesus came in when they were doing stuff in the temple they shouldn't be doing. And Jesus did what? He, he, he threw, threw their stuff all over the place, right? And he, uh, he did um, likewise there. And so in that way, Nehemiah is similar uh, to Jesus. He foreshadows Jesus. Second, in Nehemiah chapter 9 and 10, Nehemiah initiated a renewal of the old covenant. Uh, You'll remember the Israelites made a covenant to keep the covenant that God had already made with them. (laughs) Remember that? And so uh, Nehemiah was a part of that and helping to initiate that renewal of the old covenant. Um, But that anticipates the fact that they would need a new covenant. Why? Because they couldn't keep the covenant that they already had. Not from their end. God kept the covenant, but they couldn't, okay? And Jesus was the one to usher in a new covenant, amen? And so um, in that way, Nehemiah initiated, initiated a renewal of the old covenant as Jesus would bring in a whole new covenant. Third. Very similar to Ezra in Nehemiah chapter 1 when Nehemiah got the news that Jerusalem was in despair and they were in ruins and so forth. What did he do? He wept. He wept over Jerusalem. Again, like Jesus did in Luke chapter 19. Nehemiah foreshadowing some of the things that Jesus did. Fourth, Just as Nehemiah called God's people to rise up and help him build and rebuild the city and build um, the city of God, Jesus called his disciples to follow him and help him build God's kingdom. So both calling people to follow God and to build and to work, do the work of God in building his kingdom. Fifth, 
Just as the nations raged and plotted against Nehemiah in chapter 6, verse 2. If you remember, all the nations around them, what did they do? They didn't like Nehemiah. They're trying to stop the work that they were doing. In fact, they plotted against him. Remember when Sanballat and Tobiah and them, they tried to get Nehemiah to come out away from the city so that they could get him in all by himself. And they plotted against him. Just as all those nations plotted against him, Psalm chapter 2 tells us that the nations rage against the Lord's anointed. Listen, um, the ungodly secular world does not like Jesus. Amen? And we know... So we're going to talk about here in the next couple of weeks, they plotted against Jesus, right? Uh, the Jews plotted against him even as well. Uh, and so in that way, Nehemiah foreshadows some of the same similar things that happened to Jesus. And sixth, just as Nehemiah finished the wall and the work God sent him to do, so did Jesus finish the work that God gave him to do. Amen? Amen. On the cross, he said what? It is finished. And so he completed the work that God had him to do just as Nehemiah followed through and made sure that the work that God gave him to do, both physically and I believe also spiritually, was done. You know what? We could talk about lots more. In my studies this past week, man, I had to pare things down a little bit as there are so many um, things that we could look at of foreshadowing and, 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 and prefigurations in the Nehemiah and Ezra of who they were and how they foreshadowed Christ. But here's the point, that both Ezra and Nehemiah in their own way served as symbolic types, pictures, uh, images, um, glimpses, if you will, of the Messiah to come, God's anointed one. They were foreshadowers of Jesus in that they were, they were rescuers. They were restorers. And much like, if you remember, some of you who've been here for a few years, remember when we went through the book of Judges, um, they were, in a way, saviors for, for the Jewish people in leading them to rebuild the temple, leading them back to the land. They showed the people that God was still at work. They kept alive the hope that God would one day send the rescuer. God would one day send the restorer. God would one day send the savior. And so, friends, in that way, Ezra and Nehemiah were to the people of God in that day hope that God would fulfill his promises. They showed the people that God was still at work, that he'd not forgotten them and that they could trust in his promises. Friends, God's promises are still alive, amen? They are still alive. Some have been fulfilled, some not yet. Number three, so as we look at how are God's promises alive here in Ezra and Nehemiah, we see that the promises are alive in the in that the people are restored to the land. We see that the promises are alive in both Ezra and Nehemiah serving as uh, types, foreshadowings of Jesus. And the third way that we see that the promises are alive, friends, is that the lineage of the king is still alive. Listen, if you were a Jew who had returned from exile and you were wanting, or excuse me, and you were waiting for God's promises to be fulfilled. Your hope was ultimately in God sending his anointed one, the Messiah, that God had promised. Listen, every Jew knew that the Messiah, the anointed one, was of the lineage of David, right? Turn to 2 Samuel chapter 7 with me, if you will. Let's look at the promise that God made to David. Second Samuel chapter 7, verse 8, we read this. It said, Now therefore, thus, thus shall you say to my servant David. Now God is speaking to Nathan, the prophet, to give this, to tell this to David. It says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, 
I took you from the sheepfold, from following the sheep to be ruler over my people, over Israel. And I have been with you wherever you have gone and have cut off all your enemies from before you and have made you a great name like the name of the great men who are on the earth. So just like Abram, God has made David a great name, right? My, is my microphone fading in and out a little bit? Okay. Give it a little prayer. David, we're still talking about him today, amen? He's given a great name. Look at verse 10. It says, moreover, I will appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them that they may dwell in a place of their own and move no more. Nor shall the sons of wickedness oppress them anymore. So they'd already been in the land, right? They'd already been um, settled in the land. I believe here uh, God is looking forward to a time when um, God knew that they were going to be out of the land again. And so God knew that there was going to be a time they needed to come back into the land again. And so uh, he says here, nor shall the sons of wickedness oppress them any more as previously, since the time that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel and have caused you to rest from all your enemies. So God talks of a time when there would be rest and peace in the land. Also, the Lord tells you that he will make you a house. So um, here, uh, he's not talking about a physical house, but he's talking about a legacy, if you will, a, a dynasty. Uh, we talk about it as we've heard, as the house of David. Let's switch to this. There we go. Sorry. Now, I am not going to be as good with this handheld as Pastor Brandon is. Uh, so bear with me. So God promised to make David a house um, that he was going to um, uh, make his lineage last. Look at verse 12. When your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, I will set up your seed after you who will come from your body. Now, seed there, uh, we think of that as, as ancestors, and there's a sense in which that's true, but the, the word here is singular, okay? And so he's talking about one seed after you who will come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. I believe there's a double entendre going on here because if you look at verse 13, it says, he shall build a house for my name. Solomon, David's son, would build the temple, right? But Jesus would also, if in a sense, spiritually build a house for his name. And I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. So here he's prophesying about somebody not Solomon, not one of his other um, descendants there, but one who would come whose kingdom would last forever. Verse 14 tells us more. It says, I will be his father and he shall be my son. If he commits iniquity, I will chasten him with the rods of men and with the blows of the sons of men. So I believe there he's talking about some of those kings in between. But my mercy shall not depart from him as I took it from Saul, whom I removed from before you. And your house and your kingdom shall be established forever before you. Your throne shall be established forever. So God promises David that he will establish his throne, David's throne forever, meaning that through his lineage, eventually there would be one who will come from David's lineage who will reign forever. He will reign for, as king forever and will bring that ultimate peace and rest. Here's the problem. The problem was that in Ezra and Nehemiah, is there a king reigning? There's no king reigning, right? Right? There's no king uh, reigning in Israel in Ezra and Nehemiah. In fact, there had been no one reigning on the throne as king uh, since they were exiled. And so uh, since they had been conquered and defeated, there was no king because of the wickedness and idolatry and disloyalty that, God, uh, that they had had towards the Lord. God allowed them to be kingless. Friends, that's the problem here. There is no king, but also it is what they were hoping for and waiting for. They, those who went back to the land 
We're looking for God to restore the throne of David according to his promise. There hadn't been a king since the exile, but they went back knowing that God had promised one. There was an anointed one to come. There was a Messiah that was come. They came back to the promised land because they believed that God would someday fulfill the promise of one to reign on the throne of David forever. So with that understanding, is there anything we see in Ezra and Nehemiah that God that would, would show us that God's promises in a Messiah to come are, is, is still alive? Friends, yes, there is. I want you to look at a couple of verses with me here, okay? I'll tell you what, let's just look at them on the screen. Ezra chapter 3, verse 2, and Ezra chapter 5, verse 2, we read of a man named Zerubbabel the son of Shealtiel, who, look at what it says in verse 2, chapter 3, verse 2 of Ezra. It says, Then Jeshua, the son of Josadak, and his brethren, the, the priests, and Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and his brethren, arose and built the altar of the God of Israel. So these guys, including this guy named Zerubbabel, helped to rebuild the altar. Chapter 5, verse 2, So Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Jeshua, the son of Josadak, rose up and began to build the house of God. So Zerubbabel helped to rebuild the altar. He also helped to rebuild the house of God. Now, why is this important? Friends, it's important because it just so happens that this Zerubbabel was of the house and lineage of David. He was a descendant of David. And while he did not serve as king, look at this verse, Matthew chapter 1, verse 12. This is the lineage of Christ. It just so happens that this Zerubbabel is found listed in the lineage of none other than Jesus Christ. It says, Jeconiah begot Shealtiel, and Shealtiel begot Zerubbabel, and it continues on. So what does that show us? What does that tell us? Friends, it shows us that all this time, the lineage of David was being tracked that God was preserving the line of David so that he could keep the promises that he had made to David, that one from David's lineage would reign on the throne forever. Friends, so in this, what we see is that God's promises are alive. Amen? Through the book of Ezra, through the book of Nehemiah, when they didn't even have a king, the lineage of the king was still alive. That's not all. There were other indications that they were holding on to God's promises to David, including the fact, friends, they knew where the tomb of David was. Listen, they went back and the walls were destroyed. The temple was all torn down. But guess what it talks about in, in uh, Nehemiah chapter 3, verse 6? It, they knew where, where the tombs of David were. Okay, That was important to them, even when the city was destroyed. Second, they, they still referred to Jerusalem as the city of David. Um, they also were attentive to how David had prescribed their worship to be. In chapters 11 and 12 of Nehemiah, they talk about that they did worship as David had prescribed. And they even knew and referred to the palace as the house of David. And so, friends, through all of this, God's promises to David were still important to them. And they should be to us as well. Because, friends, it would be through that lineage that who would come? Jesus, the Christ. Friends, like those believing Israelites, I believe we can build our lives on the promises of God. Amen? On the wonderful and precious promises of Almighty God. Friends, He knows our frailty, He knows our weaknesses. And thus, friends, he has made provision for us. He made provision for us from, from way back, right? Just as he planned that through Abraham, all the world would be blessed. That through Abraham, he would send the seed of the woman who would also be the seed of David to redeem us from our sins. You know, this morning... I want to close by asking a question. I'm going to phrase it a couple different ways. But I want you to think about something this morning. What, what if you could have, what if you could get everything you ever wanted? 
Okay, just think about it for a minute. What if you could have and get, obtain everything you ever wanted, but you didn't have Jesus? What if, what if, you, could, what if you could have success guaranteed? What if you could have money coming out your ears? What if you could have fame and fortune, even family, even a stressless life? here on this earth, all those things that we seek on this earth. What if you could have all of that, friends, but you didn't have Jesus? What if you could have all those pleasures, but there was no hope of life after death? I don't know about you, but I believe that would be an awful way to live. Without any hope, with no lasting eternal hope, no matter what you did on this earth, no hope after death. No matter how successful you were on this earth, no hope. When you died, you died. Now, I understand there's some people who believe that. But no matter how many goals you met, no hope. No matter how fulfilled you felt, no, how much, no matter how much good you did or no matter how many people you helped, that this life was all there was and there was no hope after that. Friends, fortunately... That is not the teaching of the Word of God. Amen? Fortunately, that is not the teaching of Scripture nor the message of God. The message of God, the message of this book from cover to cover is that there is hope. Despite our sin that started in the garden with Adam and Eve, right? Despite our disobedience to God, despite our running after idols, as the Israelites did, despite our disobeying God and doing what we want to do many times, just like the Israelites did, friends, there is hope. And the hope thread that runs through this Bible is the hope that is seated in the anointed one of God, the Messiah, the one we're going to celebrate here in just a couple of weeks that died on the cross to pay the penalty for our sins and rose again to give us new life. Isn't that glorious hope? So here's the thing, friends. Hope for a Christian is not... Because when we say hope in the English language, it, it, it kind of sounds like, I hope this is going to happen, but it might not. When you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, the hope that we have in Christ is a certainty. It is a sure thing. It's not something we have to, oh, well, okay, I'm hoping in this because, you know, I hope it's real. I hope, listen, friends, I know as sure as I'm standing here that that hope is real. I know that I'm going to be in heaven with Jesus one day. You say, well, pastor, that sounds awful cocky. No, it doesn't because it has nothing to do with what I've done. It has everything to do with what he's done. And we praise him for that. Our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Amen? I love that song that we sang this morning um, about the hope that we have in Christ. Friends, I want to ask you today, do you have that hope? Are you trusting in the promises of God? Are you trusting in the hope that only comes by a relationship with Jesus Christ and knowing Him as your Lord and Savior? That's an offer. If you're here personally today, if you're watching us online, that's an offer that God extends to all. Repent ye therefore, the Bible says, and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. In other words, if we'll turn from our sin and we'll believe and trust him as our Savior, then the promise of God is that he will forgive us and our name will be written in heaven in the book of life forever. Amen? That's a promise of God. So when we talk about this, rebuilding your life on the promises of God, friends, that is the ultimate promise that I'm building my life on. I don't have plan B. I, I, when I step into eternity, and we're all going to do this, okay? Um, I did a funeral this week of, a, unfortunately, a 44-year-old 40, 40, young lady who went to be with Jesus. Uh, we're not guaranteed tomorrow. Um, and so, do you know him? 
I, my, my, my trust is when I step over that into death, into eternity. The only thing I'm trusting in to hold me is Jesus. But that's all I need. Listen, you say, I don't know that I believe. Listen, try it all. Go out into the world. Listen, there's only two religions. And I hate to use the word religion, but there's only two. There's really only two. Christianity and everything else. And let me tell you why I can say that. Okay? What the difference is. In everything else, every other religion is man's attempt in some way, shape, or form to get to God. To earn his way to God, to be good enough to, to, to be reincarnated or to, 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 be, to reach nirvana or whatever. But some other way by works, good works or terrorist works or something, whatever, to get to God. That's every other religion. Man tries to reach God. But in Christianity, God came to man. He came down to redeem us and save us because he knew we couldn't do it on our own. Friends, what are you trusting in today? If you've never trusted him as your Lord and Savior, I want to encourage you to do that today. But you know, I know probably most of you here, most watching online, have made that commitment. You're trusting in the promise of Jesus as your Savior. But you know what I can almost guarantee is that there are other promises of God that you're not living by. Maybe that's a promise of purity. Maybe that's a promise that has to do with sanctification. Um, maybe it has to do with uh, a promise um, of, of following him and something he's called you to do. Friends, today, would you stand on all the promises of God? Would you trust them all? Would you trust that God's way is better than your way? in whatever area you know he's speaking to you about? And would you surrender to him in that today? Let's pray.